Welcome to the Conduit Deeper Podcast, a podcast that takes a deep dive into the details that surround our current sermon series. From current events to fascinating finds to conversations that take us deeper into the Word. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Deeper Podcast. My name is Mo, Executive Pastor at Conduit Church, joined with our lead pastor, Darren Tyler, who is back uh, for a second week in a row. Um, we're kind of on a we're kind of on a uh, a roll now, a rhythm. Yep, I'm, I think I'm past the jet lag. Ugh, maybe. Is it true that jet lag, like the the number of days it takes to recover from jet lag, uh, is equal to the number of days it took to travel back? It's the number of hours that you were ahead or behind ah. equals to a day. So I was twelve hours ahead, give or take. I should be twelve days. <laughs> In, I I feel like those are just things that people make up, but I, you know, I'm seven days in and I'm starting to feel not upside down. Like I didn't wake up at two a.m. last night and go like clean the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, but you also came back with, with a kind of a nasty. What's it called? A trekker's cough? The kumbu cough. Trekker's cough. Kumbu for the kumbu glaciers. Wow, it's so wet up there. Yeah, and there's no oxygen, so you end up just inhaling. It's like a cold humidifier. Mm, that's not yeah. good for the lungs. No, it turns out it's not. And um, but you're feeling better. Yeah. All right. Yeah, good. I'm on the I'm on the mend. I don't sound that great, but I'm on the mend. Well, I mean, if you really embrace it, I mean, it just does have a low resin. It's nice. A low resin? Yeah, a little, it resonates very low. <laughs> I've got a yeah. little bit of res resin is something I think I had surgically removed. <laughs> no. from, I, had a little, I had a little resin shaved off of that. Like, uh, huh. no, it's got a good. Got a good texture. I did like on Sunday, like my voice was by the third service. Sadly, that was the one where I felt like I kind of came together. You know, we have to choose which service we put on the podcast, but it was the one I sounded the worst, but I felt like it was the one I finally yeah, I went sewed back it together. To it. I was like, man, his voice is betraying him right now. <laughs> it's so bad. So bad. Like, it's hard to I've do. never, like, there was a moment, I guess I can tell you this now, about 2 a.m. Saturday where I thought, I might have to call in. Like, I'm oh, wow. I was sick as a dog. I, I don't know if I had a fever. I couldn't, you know, we moved, so I still don't know where our thermometer is. It's not like, I don't know how you guys, do you have a place for the thermometer? Like, we, it, it seems like whenever someone's sick, yeah. nobody knows where the thermometer is. <laughs> and you had a move on top of that. So I don't know. I, I kept thinking it was, you know, Trekker's cough, but by... Yeah, by Sunday morning, it was like, oh, man. Yeah, I was waited, waiting with bated breath for that <clears throat> inevitable text that says, man, I am sick as a dog. Uh, it, it was... Speaking of dogs, this was your uh, part of your title for the teaching on Sunday. <laughs> I mean, if you want to use that as a segue, I guess we can. Yeah, that, that's, you know. The dogs and hogs. Yeah. Second Peter chapter two, false prophets, false teachers. Yeah. We, uh, we, laid, we left that one ready for you. When you came back, obviously, to hit out of the park um, and address a, a, a controversial. It's so interesting. You know, these were it, this was an issue 2,000 years ago for, for the early church. Yeah. For Peter. These, this idea of dealing with false teachers, yeah. false prophets. And it's still an issue today. Yeah, I mean, it really struck me, and in a little bit, we're going to talk about, you know, some of the, I think, some of the logical conclusion of weak teaching is weak voting. So you and I are going to talk the, the two or three issues that the Christians have got to face on the ballot this time. But the only reason we have to have that conversation is we've had really weak teaching in the churches for the last 30, 40 years. But it didn't start 30 to 40 years ago. It started 2,000 years ago, and it's so... I mean, it's human nature. If if you are in a culture that is uh, adversarial to who you are, adversarial to what you believe, the temptation is to uh, shave off what you believe to make it more palatable just so people leave you alone. I mean, it's a human nature thing. Somewhere along the lines, we thought that, and I don't know where we got this from the Bible, but if if what I say is true and it makes somebody mad— like, in other words, the test isn't whether it makes somebody mad or no. The test isn't whether it's true or not. The test is whether it made somebody mad or not. And you can look back and think, okay, a lot of what's happened in, in the church world in the last 30 years has been that. Okay, this 
topic of abortion is suddenly a political issue, not a moral one, and it makes people mad, so we just don't talk about it. That's false teaching. And uh, it was so pr appropriate because I just came back from Nepal where uh, Berender, and he just said this in passing, the pastor we work with there, that they've got to be uh, adamant with their pastors that we're training that they don't allow the culture to creep into it. They don't allow the government to creep into it. They, you know, the, the temptation is to water down the gospel, to get the government to leave them alone, to get the culture to leave them alone. And I'm like, oh, that's 100% what happened with Peter, and it's 100% what's happening in America. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really good distinction. That's something that we should talk about, and that is how and why and when, perhaps, did the church divorce itself from politics and, and, and it be so— um, frowned upon to have any overlap yeah. whatsoever over the past, again, 30, 40 years. I, I don't know the exact time frame, but there seems to be, um, again, it's it's just pushback over the past several decades that if you start to talk about politics within the church, that that's a bad thing, that it's not good, that it's frowned upon, that those should stay separate. Yeah. Where did that come from? What do you think it came from? I don't know. I mean, it's something I've been kind of ruminating with over mm -hmm. the past few weeks to figure out why there's such a divide. Like, why is it yeah. so segmented and segregated? This And it, the, the phrase that's always thrown around is separation of church and state. Yeah, the establishment clause. And I just feel like that's a cop-out. Uh, it is a cop-out because it was never – it's not even written. First of all, the words separation of church right. and state, not in the Constitution. <laughs> but the, the Establishment Clause was to keep the government out of the church, not the other way around. Now, I will say one caveat that I thought was brilliant was – they didn't want a state-mandated religion. Like, that's where the Crusades came from. That's uh, William Tyndale was burned at the stake by uh, a theocratic government. So our founding fathers had wisdom in that, but they never meant it to be a lack of influence of Christians in government. They meant it to be that the government wasn't able to influence religion. So we've yeah. reversed it. So on, on one sense, I think that's where it came from. But I, it doesn't seem like that bothered Martin Luther King. You know what I mean? He's a pastor. You know, he, he spoke courageously, took a lot of heat for it, and was, uh, was assassinated because of it. But you don't hear, because this is where I think is really interesting to me, is it, it, was, it feels a little bit like um, during the COVID years where, okay, you're allowed to protest uh, for George Floyd, not allowed to gather or protest for the election. So in other words, it was like if the cause was important enough, then you could do this. And so uh, on this church side, uh, I mean, you shared a clip with me this morning of a, a Koinonia Christian Center Church hosting Kamala Harris at— uh, Yeah, their Sunday service. Sunday service. Greenville, North Carolina. Yeah. Um, the The— Female pastor or bishop, Bishop Rosie O'Neill invited her good friend and quote unquote servant of God, Kamala right. Harris, to speak to their congregation on Sunday. And nobody is crying Christian nationalism <laughs> right. at that. Exactly. And nobody cried Christian nationalism when Pastor Ray Ortland, who, by the way, is a upstanding, lovely human being. And I just happen to disagree vehemently with his his tweet, which was since deleted, right? Today, uh, how, how do you put it? Never Trump, comma, today, Kamala or Harris, whatever, and comma, always Jesus. In other words, he is a, he's making a I support Kamala Harris for president tweet. Yes. And nobody was crying Christian nationalism at him. So what, it, what feels to me is that the problem isn't about separation of church and state. It's the separation of ch conservatism uh, and state that is as long as it's not a white person conservative then um if, if it is that then it's christian nationalism and we're all gonna you know lose our, our crap over it which is why josh howerton can make a, a preach a sermon josh who is maybe one of the most affable smiley kind you know young courageous leaders who is being crucified on twitter for just saying hey here these are some important issues and we're voting and and why Ray Ortland was roundly just 
uh, they just look the other way. And by the way, I know that Ray and Josh know each other. Again, I Emmanuel Church here in Nashville. Uh, Ray, you know, he's a Presbyterian, so you know, I, I don't hold that against him. But um, lovely human being, and just happens to be wrong. But my, my point is, is if he gets to say that, then why wouldn't we? And I think that that's somewhere along the line, separation of church and state, and then. You know, look, they do say, there. you know, supposedly uh, we could lose our tax ID number because we want the church out of that. So we don't want the church to be able to um, endorse candidates, whatever. Again, nobody's calling for calling any of Christian centers right. tax uh, to be revoked. But w- once I started to figure that out, I'm like, okay, well, then we're done here. Like if, if, if it's the secular culture that gets to decide what is and is not political— well, then I'm done with that. Like, we don't, the, the government nor the culture gets to tell us what is and is not. In the same way with COVID, they don't get to tell us with our voting what I can and cannot say. You are referring to um, Josh Howerton, pastor at Lake Point Church in Dallas, who spoke on October the 6th um, with a sermon titled How to Vote Like Jesus, which he, um, details, you know, what that looks like and specifically the, the lack of political engagement and silence from church leaders across the country to address these issues yeah. and lays out a, um, a, a path, a, a grid in which what voting like Jesus could look like. Right. Um, and you know, it's it's taken off, right? I mean, there's a lot of people talking about it be, because it's such a, a hot button subject. And that being the election in of itself, and then you know the church addressing this seems to be like combustible fire. <laughs> it's yeah, just like you're not allowed to talk about it from a conservative point of view because the immediate assumption is the immediate assumption is that if a conservative Christian pastor is talking about how to vote like Jesus, that they are automatically assuming that it's a, um, a teaching or in support of Trump. Yeah. That's the logical conclusion, which yeah. is- And the orange man is bad. Yeah. And the deranged Trump syndrome is, is alive and well. And when I think back to What we taught this last Sunday, again, false teaching produces false voters, right? False voting. Um, But the false teaching part is, like, maybe we should start with that, that there's a difference between a pastor who is, or a teacher who is in error. You know, there are are theologians out there that would say, uh, if if you come out of the Bethel Redding world, for instance, that that's, that's a false religion, it's a false whatever. But they do believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, crucified, buried, resurrected on the third day, just as the scriptures were, you know, foretold. Like if you could go to the Apostles' Creed and they believe everything in that, then are they just somebody who's in error or are they someone who's a wolf? The problem that I'm experiencing in seeing is that if it's just somebody in error, which I, I would think this is my personal opinion, the the folks at Bethel Reading, there's some things that they believe and say that I don't see in scripture, but it doesn't mean they're wolves. But what has happened, especially in the bitter Twitter misery theme park, is that any teacher or Bible teacher that says something that they disagree with is now not only wrong, they're a wolf. So I felt like it was important to let, let's at least start with defining what is and what is not a wolf. What is, what is not a false teacher versus what is a teacher who is, is wrong, which is what I feel like Peter lays out pretty good by st- the end of the chapter, he refers to the dogs and the hogs, you know, the swine um, who will turn on you and you know, take you out and the dogs who return to their puke or the two main ones that he focuses on. A quote from Howerton's teaching, and I just want you to just maybe comment on the, on the quote. Um, he says, you cannot read the Bible about Moses, Daniel, Esther, Nathan, Nehemiah, John the Baptist, and think that the church— and pastors should avoid addressing government and governmental leaders. You just can't do it. It's all throughout the Bible. 100%. True. Yeah, I mean, again, Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2 or 3, he talks about, you know, honoring the government, uh, honoring those in authority. And 
he's executed for disobeying the orders of those. And so even Peter, you know, Paul, same thing. We, we, we get Romans 13, right, um, which has been used to say, well, you can't disobey the government at all, written by a guy executed for disobeying the government. So clearly there is no evidence in Scripture that we ought to be silent. I mean, John the Baptist was executed because he called uh, Herod, you know, uh, some pretty ugly names, yeah. which were all accurate. And so, you know, that said, it doesn't mean we're not going to have consequences. Obviously, there's going to be consequences when you're speaking truth. When the world is built on lies, if you speak the truth, that's an act of revolution. Revolutionaries, it's a very, it's a very dangerous job. Yeah, the next part of this, I think, is exactly where we would stand as Conduit Church and how we addressed and handled, um, have handled things over the past four years. And he says this, this is Josh continuing from this teaching. What's happening right now is the church is not getting more political. Politics are getting more theological and politics are getting more spiritual. When the government moved past things like building roads, issuing driver's license and teaching math to things like redefining marriage, erasing gender, reframing abortion as reproductive rights, and then using government school system to indoctrinate everybody's kids into believing those things, the church didn't move, politics did. Yeah, think about that. That's a, those are, everything mentioned right there, those are moral issues dealt with from the scriptures, not political issues dealt with in Congress. And when you think about, I, when people have complained you know, why does everything got to be so political? Which we don't get a lot of anymore. I feel like that. that... We have the past few weeks. <laughs> oh, have we? <laughs> <laughs> We've gotten a few of, yeah, we. Uh, Are they emailing you now and not me? Is that what happens? It, word gets around, you okay. know, it, whether it's at the, at our, we had somebody a couple weeks ago, I don't know, maybe two, three weeks ago, come to the connect desk after church and was just asking that question. Why is everything so political? Yeah. And what was I talking about? Abortion, gender, yeah. those are not political issues. Right. But again, if we allow the government, if we allow secular humanism to tell us what is and is not political, then we're allowing the world to disciple us. And as a church, if I don't speak about it, then I'm letting, I'm ceding that ground to the, uh, I'm ceding that ground to politics and I'm not interested in that. Yeah. And, and then after it was kind of reframed in, in, in that way to this person, um, they were willing to kind of see that and say, okay, well, let me come back next week. Let's talk about that. And let's, let's, let me just listen a little bit longer. And now they're kind of all in. They kind of had a light bulb go off hmm. and um, they're here for it, which I, I, I found encouraging. Another example of maybe talking us through false teaching versus inerrant teaching. There was a clip that's been going around um actually this morning or this week, earlier this week, from uh, our good friend Andy Stanley down in Atlanta. Um, he's doing a new sermon series on miracles then and now, and he's he poses this question, do you need to believe in miracles to be a Christian? And which <laughs> I personally believe is kind of the wrong question. Yeah. Um given kind of what he's sharing here. And this is a, um, it's a bit of a long clip, but I'm just going to play like the last 30 seconds of it. Kay. And, and then we can kind of, we can kind of talk about that. And the second statement, the miracle of the resurrection is the foundation of our faith in Jesus. So if you're looking for, and I know you're not, but you know, if you're looking for the irreducible minimum number of miracles, you have to believe in order to be a Christian. If you're considering Christianity and like, do I have to believe a guy put everybody on a boat? Really? You just start here. The foundation, the miracle of the universe, foundation of faith in God, miracle of resurrection, foundation of our faith and Jesus. But once you accept this miracle, you will find many of those other miracles far more acceptable. So he's saying that the, there's only two miracles really required to believe in, and that is the creation of the universe and the resurrection, which I feel like is a really, it's just a wrong categorization of the entire topic. Yeah. <laughs> it's so narrow, narrow-minded and not narrow-minded. It's just, it's siloed in a way that's not yeah. the full story at all. Yeah. I mean, there's an intellectual disconnect. I mean, for starters, 
I want to acknowledge that he is acknowledging that there was a literal resurrection of Jesus. And he gets a lot of um, knocks, and many of them pretty well deserved. But he separates himself here from, say, Richard Rohr, uh, from Rob Bell, from uh, Brian McLaren, because he's saying, I believe in a literal physical resurrection. True. And as the Apostle Paul says, if we don't have that, like it hinges on everything. If there's no resurrection, you and I could go back to getting jobs and making money for a living as opposed to this, if there wasn't a literal resurrection. So I want to give him credit for that. And this clip, so to me, this clip is just an, in, this is an interesting uh, way to try to parse this, but this clip to me would be an error, not a wolf kind of moment or a uh, false prophet, false teacher. Now that said, Andy has said plenty of things that falls into that category. Um, th this one is more like there's an error in that, like if... You want to believe in Jesus. Jesus believed that there were people on a boat. Jesus believed in Noah. Jesus believed in the creation of the world. Like, so to say that you can believe in Jesus and not believe what he believed is an intellectually untenable. Like it's, it's almost like he's just moving the goal lines to make it more simple. But it's like he doesn't actually say that I don't believe in these other miracles. It's just if you believe in these two, it makes the other ones easier to believe. So it feels like I get what he's saying. I just think it is, is like you said, it's just the wrong question. You, you put the wrong question and you get the wrong answer. I just don't like the premise of it at all. Obviously he excludes the virgin birth, um, which would be one of the major ones in our doctrinal beliefs. Yeah. Um, but to silo it in that way, in such a, a very binary. Yeah. Um, and it's just the wrong question. Do you need to believe in miracles to be a Christian? I just it, it just feels like it's implying other things that doesn't yeah. need to be asked. Yeah, to me the question, the best question would be, do I need to believe what Jesus believed to be a Christian? <laughs> right. The answer is yes. And so and again, what he's I feel like what he meant, maybe I haven't listened to the series, but if you believe in the resurrection, then you know, suddenly a world created in seven days or uh, an arc like those become very. If you believe someone resurrected from the dead, it opens up a lot. So I see what he's saying, but I don't. He's asking the wrong question. But the the to me the flip of that is. So one of the things that Paul talks or Paul Peter talks about in Second Peter is the false teachers uh, appealing not to intellect but appealing to lustful desires. Like they will, at those first few verses, he starts talking about what a false teacher is. And they, which is something Andy has done, uh, is when he, he's redefining sexuality, he's redefining gender. I, I've heard the tapes that he was recorded um, in closed door settings with pastors saying that, uh, you know, the church has got this issue wrong in homosexuality, that we need, we need to apologize to homosexuals. Um, there's ministry in their church that, uh, actually encourages, you know, young people to explore their sexuality or they wouldn't use that language, of course. But point is when you hear him talk about it, he never once appeals to truth for that. He appeals to, well, we don't want to hurt their feelings. We've, we've done a bad job because we've, we've made people sad with it. In other words, he's not appealing to intellect. He's appealing to desires. And lustful desires is epithumia, which is the uh, an ultimate desire, not just any desire, but an ultimate desire. Like, um, and he he appeals to that. And so, to, to to me, the difference between a false teacher and a teacher in error. Uh, again, I get, I make error, I make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Peter made mistakes. Peter was, you know, rebuked by Paul. Right? Like they they had a huge blow up over a disagreement of theology. Peter wasn't a wolf. Now the 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 definitions in the scriptures, which is probably worth repeating, you know, the the swine, uh, he talks about the swine, well, let me just read the verse, uh, wallowing in the mud, and refers to that as a false teacher. And what I've experienced with that, and what I think you see in the scripture from that, is that the swine, the pigs, so to speak, are the ones that are appealing to the lustful desires to get you to join them in the mud, to, get, to drag you into it. So that's like the culture the, allowing the culture to influence your theology, which happens in Nepal, it happened in Asia Minor, and it's happening in America. 
the, the second one is the, the dogs and the dogs that return to their vomit. Paul, Philippians 3, verse 2, says that a dog, he talks about the dogs as the mutilators of the flesh. They're the ones that were religious and laws. And it was, uh, for, for them, it would have been the Pharisees, right? The, the, their version of bitter Twitter, which was, here are the rules and the regulations and the policies and the procedures. And if you violate one of them, then you are out of here. You are. And that's what happened with Peter in the book of Acts was that he would not be seen in public with those who were not circumcised. He was sitting at separate tables and Paul said, I had no small disagreement with Peter over this. And legalism. Legalism. And what was interesting to me is that legalism, I've always framed it because that's the world you or I would have grown up in is fundamentalist kind of Christianity, the, the legalism. But there is a secular legalism that is the exact same demonic yes. spirit. Yes. And when you think about that, okay, what does a dog do? A dog just barks a lot, you know. For the most part, the dogs are different than the wolves because the dogs are just going to bark. If you, if you stand up to them, they might make noise, but they go away. But the one thing they do is repeat the same tropes, vomit over and over again. As a dog returns to his vomit, so does a fool, right, to his folly. And he refers to them as dogs, the, the legalists. And then the wolves, which Peter doesn't talk about wolves, but Jesus did in the same context of in Matthew 7 when he's talking about the, the pigs and the swine. He also refers to the wolves. And I, this, this may be a stretch, but it's not lost on me that the Roman government, their national animal was a wolf. And in Luke 10, 3, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. And so the wolves, I, I think, represent the government influence on our church, like the government influence on our teaching. And the government wants us to be silent. The government wants these not, you know, issues like abortion or same-sex marriage. They want us silent on those things because they want to eat us, which is what a wolf does. You can't tell a wolf by what they wear, but by what they eat. And whether or not this pastor, bishop, whatever it was in North Carolina is a wolf, I don't know, having Kamala Harris. But putting Kamala Harris, the leader of a death cult called the Democratic Party, that feels pretty wolf-like to me. Three weeks from today, will we know who the president of the United States is? No. <laughs> Do you think? I mean, no. I mean, I, I have absolutely zero confidence in any of that process. Um, I want to. But yeah, I mean, the election is three weeks from yesterday. And so it should stand a reason that we would know um, <clears throat> within 24 hours. But we know how that, that went down last time. I expect nothing different. Yeah, I don't either. This time. I mean, how long did it take Pennsylvania to count it was votes? Like two weeks. I mean, Texas is done. I mean, if I, I remember uh, one of the things that really, uh, that I feel like didn't get enough attention was, you know, Texas sued Pennsylvania. Right. Which was an interesting. It's really interesting. Yeah, because it's a legitimate question. Hey, we can count. Why can't you count? And now we as a state are suffering because you guys are knuckleheads and can't figure out how to count votes. State suing another state. Yeah. Over a pretty obvious. Yeah. But I, I look, that feels so third world country to me that we can't count votes in modern day. Yeah, somebody was making the argument about all of the, the new technology that, that Elon and Tesla are releasing right now from his... Um, from the satellites and the and Starlink to this huge monster rocket he just launched and returned this week. I don't know if you saw that. It's unbelievable. It's pretty crazy. Um, and these these robots that he unleashed, this new um, <laughs> this new cab service that he's uh, automated cab service he's re releasing. All these incredible modern technologies that are happening that are just mind blowing. And we're st we still can't figure out how to vote, <laughs> how to count how to count votes. It's like, why can't we put right. somebody in charge to figure this out yeah. with all the technology we have? I mean, I can order deodorant on Amazon right now, and it'll be at my house by the time I get home, and we think can't of, count a vote. Think of all the logistics involved yeah. to get that item to your house, uh, either the same yeah. day or the next day. It's yeah. unbelievable. With that being said— we are all going to vote. Yes, we are all going to vote in three weeks. Um, we need to. What are some of the most important issue, issues on the ballot that you see uh, heading into this election? 
it's hard to narrow this down, but if I narrow it down, this is my opinion. It'd be interesting to see what yours are. These are moral issues that have been hijacked by politics. And at least the, uh, of the issue of abortion is. That's a, that is a moral issue. So abortion, the, the murder of an unborn child, the Democratic Party for decades, their platform was, we want to make it safe and rare. Okay, that's what a lot of Republicans are saying now. Democratic Party, on the other hand, made no bones about it. It is shout your abortion. We're proud of your abortion. Oh, by the way, here's some mobile abortion clinics at our Democratic Party. That makes them a death cult. Absolutely. Like, there's no wiggle room on this. These are children, and there is no voice that is less empowered or more oppressed than the voice of an unborn child inside and the world, if the church has been silent on this, like the cover of the Wall Street Journal this morning was how many women now are supporting Kamala Harris on nothing else, no other basis than my body, my choice. And that is not the gospel. The gospel is my body broken for you. And for those women that might hear this, I always feel important to say if you've part of the 25 to 30 percent of women in the church that have had an abortion, there is mercy, there is grace, there is forgiveness. But there is no excuse to continue to support that. So uh, number one is abortion. And number two, which is tied directly to this, is the courts. The courts are everything, which is why the Democratic Party is talking about changing the way we appoint justices, changing the scope of the courts, because they keep losing their chances to uh, to appoint justices. But... George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, like Donald Trump, like people that have said they were anti-abortion never moved any legislation whatsoever. And for a long time, I thought, I don't even, I, I can say I'm voting pro-life, but every one of these candidates, nobody's changing the laws. But in the courts, there, if, if we did not have the justices we had appointed through Donald Trump, we would Roe v. Wade would still be the law of the land. It just would. Yeah. Like there's a reason the entire left wing Democratic Party was apoplectic when Roe v. Wade was overturned because it's literally the core of their religion is my body, my choice, not my body broken for you. So the courts, um, these are lifetime appointments. Yeah. Right now we have a fairly, I mean, you know, maybe it's, I, I am going to say this because there's, this is true in theology and it's true in the law. The difference between the left and the right is really simple. The right says we want to look at what the Constitution says and we want to rule according to what the law says is legal or not legal. That's what we say as conservatives when we look at the scriptures. It's the difference between me and Andy Stanley, which is I'm looking at the Bible saying, okay, what does this say? What did the writer, what did God mean by it? And what do I respond to it? Andy Stanley would say, Eh, that's the best they understood at the time, but we know more now. That's what the left wing of the courts say. That they the the Constitution is not a perfect document; it's a living document. Would be the language they would use, which means we can adapt it. And that's why you see that direct split on most ideologies is not political. It's a way of reading and ruling in the Constitution, conserving versus changing based on our our preferences. So having judges in the courts. And that to me, the third one, which, which ought to be one of the most important for every Christian on the planet, is freedom of expression. The idea that right now in Scotland, in the UK, that they are passing laws that if I say abortion is a sin and somebody's offended by that, that I could be criminally and civilly held liable for that. And when you get back to the US, you know, former Senator Clinton. Is, is actually saying, hey, people should be civilly, criminally held liable for what she calls, quote, hate speech or misinformation. Sounds great, except for who gets to define what hate speech is. And the last thing any of us need or want is a government deciding what is and what is not hate speech. That's what's happening in Nepal right now. Me baptizing a guy who turned from Hinduism and turned to Christ is considered forced conversion, hate speech, and is illegal. Do we want that in our country? Because that's the line that is being drawn right now with the, with the left as far as pressuring for 
all those things that they pressured the social media companies to be silent on, the vast majority turned out to be true. The vast majority turned out to be, but even if they weren't, who gets to be the arbiter of that? That ought to be on the front of every one of our minds because it isn't most of what you or I would say to be, like for instance, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That is very much an exclusive statement. That is not an inclusive statement. That is a Jesus is the way. Everything else is excluded from it. That would be considered hate speech in some circles right now. Protecting the courts is, um, I think, paramount. I think you're dead on with that. So we have nine Supreme Court justices, six conservative, three liberal. Trump himself appointed three of those in his last term alone. Yeah. The, the rumor is that if Trump was to get in again this time, that the two oldest Supreme Court justices, which are Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito, would retire. Yeah. Um, they are both 76 and 74. They would retire over this next term, allowing then Trump to appoint two more conservatives that obviously it's a, it's a lifetime yeah. appointment. And so that would cover the next couple of generations. Yeah. Uh, the, the youngest Supreme Court justice is Amy Coney Barrett at 52. And she's got a lot of life left in her. Yeah. Right. Um, and was a key in, in helping Roe versus Wade overturn that. So, yeah, yeah I mean, the, having control of the courts is a major yeah. issue. An important distinction. You said conservative right, versus liberal or demo, what you, progressive. Liberal. Liberal. Is those are, someone might hear those and think, oh, those are political terms. But they're not. They're a way of living in the world. Conserving what is here, conserving what is in the Constitution. For us, it's conserving what is in the Scripture versus we, it's a living thing that we get to just add and change at our, at our whim. So those are co-opted to be political terms, but they're actually a way of living and thinking in the world. And being able to have justices that believe that the Constitution, imperfect, is still the law. If you want to change the law, that's why we have Congress. That's why we have Senate. But the three liberal justices on the courts would disagree with that. We get to change the laws. They, they would never, ever admit to it being legislating from the bench. But that's the difference, is legislating from the bench versus ruling on legislation at the bench. And if we have four more years of, uh, of a Harris you know, they've, I don't know that they would, if, I don't even know how they could do it, but they've said very clearly one of their ideas is to expand the number of justices yes. so that they could stack the courts into the future. Like that's, you know, that's the last thing we need. Yeah, th that's exactly what they want to do. They want to pack the courts and the initial conversation is to move from nine to 13, which would um, align with the number of circuit, federal circuit courts that there are sounds it sounds great on paper like we need yeah. to make this more fair that's we know how this works yeah there has never been a power given to a government that the government gives up yes after they've received it no, they'll push it to the absolute extreme and then never give it up without some kind of force with it and expanding the courts beyond imagine how crazy it would be is already politically heated but expanding it and then installing, you know, the amount of, it would be a, it, w it would be a disaster for our nation for freedom. I mean, it's, it's literally what was happening um, in Israel was the, the uh, before this war happened, there was a huge battle right now over there about as far as the courts go. So even in Israel, most democracies right now that the courts are where the major fear is for us as believers, we don't have a, we don't have a good candidate to vote for here. I have, voiced my frustrations with former President Trump. It makes no difference because I'm just a nobody, but it, it, he's the one that shut the country down initially. He is the one that instituted the vaccines. And I know all the reasons and I know he, you know, he was wrong and he, he would go a long way if he would just say that, by the way. But be that as it may, we do not have a perfect candidate. What we have now are two options in front of us. One of them is either going to lessen evil or extend evil. You know, President Trump is not a pro-life candidate. He is just not. But he at least is a saying, I will let the courts decide that. 
So when I'm heading into the ballots this time, and what I pray every believer does when they head into the ballots is saying, it's not the lesser of two evils, but who is going to lessen the evil in our nation? And the main place we can do that is through the courts. I remember when uh, Amy Cornet, Cornell, Coney Barrett, Coney Barrett. I, I, it doesn't, I don't want it to be Coney because I feel like Coney Island, so I keep, <laughs> I keep wanting to change her name because it feels weird. But you remember it was Senator Dianne Feinstein that said to her, you know, the dogma lives loudly in you. Yes. You know, wow. there is not supposed to be a religious test for that. And they were 100% giving her a religious test for that. Basically saying, because you're religious, you are dogmatic, You there's dogma, and you should not be allowed in here. Now, as far as I know, she is Catholic, so she would not be considered, in my estimation, a, a, a Christian in the terms of fundamental, you know, orthodox Christianity. But she at least shares the same values we share. And what Feinstein was saying, the late... I mean, she was like a hundred. I feel like they, it was like weekend at uh, Diane Feinstein's. Like they were just rolling her out on a refrigerator dolly like the last couple of years because she, you know, was a hundred years old. But she was looking at someone like Barrett who looks, who thinks in, like we, you and I think that human life is valuable. And to her, that's a dogma that needs to be kicked out. That if that's who we want in the courts are people who have no moral standard, then God help our country. Man, I, I think we're all trying to figure out what these next couple months looks like, you know, because there's an election and then there's um, there's after the election, how many days, how many weeks, mm -hmm. everybody waiting with bated breath, how this is going to go, what could possibly happen in the middle of that, uh, are there going to be protests, are there going to be riots, um, and then once a uh, decision is made— then there's all that time leading up to the inauguration, which is through the holidays. Then there's an inauguration of which is going to bring its own uh, pomp and circumstance <laughs> of potential rioting and protesting. Lord knows what's in the mix. And then you have someone in office that's going to immediately start making decisions. Yeah. Um, and then the fallout from, from that. And on the front of everybody's mind is the economy as well. Right? Yeah, it's and like, it very well should be. As as things are just spinning out of control, even at the grocery store, it's just it's it's discouraging. <laughs> um, point being, every every everybody is feeling the anxiety of all of this right now. You can you can it's palatable. You can cut it with a knife. It feels like in a lot of conversations, and so I think it's just timely, as it always is when we go through a sermon series that the. The, the content seems to line up with where we are in the world, yeah, uh, which is pretty <laughs> awesome. Um, it, it just helps. It helps give clarity in the middle of a lot of chaos. And so even even tackling some of these conversations about you know, how to vote or how we should think about voting um, and, and how this isn't a new conversation, that how the church and government have been intertwined for yeah. thousands of years. Uh, it's an, it's an important reminder for us that we need to stay vigilant. Yeah, we as God's representatives on earth. It's it's I, I'm embarrassed that I bought into this for a while. That hey, I'm here to preach the gospel, especially because I'm a political junkie. I mean, I've been a political junkie my whole life, but I sort of had this buy-in with that idea. And I look back and, you know, of course, in our modern world, being wrong, you know, they usually they, you get accused of being a flip-flopper and you changed and, you know, and the answer is, yeah, 100% I've changed my mind. I'm looking at this world. I got kids, you know, I, hopefully I got some grandkids. You got some grandkids. The world that we leave them, should Jesus tarry, that's on us. You know, the fact that, you know, Micah, who's sitting here, and Caleb, you know, in their 20s are in a world where the inflation is just out of control the church is, there's some culpability in that and because we just, we sort of absconded our responsibilities when it comes to voting, when it comes to what our, what our future is. Peter had no concept of voting or having a voice in government as far as there was a dictator and everybody worked for the dictator. And I know that Josh did a little bit of a civics lesson in his sermon, but the fact is, is we're a constitutional republic. They work for us. They're called public servants, not public masters. We, it's the exact opposite for us to step out and not be engaged and involved 
is a, 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 a we're, we're not respond, uh, engaging with our responsibilities as fathers, as grandfathers, as leaders in our community and in this world. Heading into this Sunday, you're um, you're into first. I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter three. Where where does he go? He comes out of this false teachers, false prophets. Where does where does he go next? The return of Christ. Get your crap together. Love it. Like Jesus is coming back. How timely, right? <laughs> I sure hope so. Like the, now is not a time to be you know cautious and holding back. Jesus is returning, and I'm going to cover a little bit of that with. Those that say, like Peter says, hey, uh, he's, uh, you know, everybody's talking forever. Why is Jesus not returning? You know, why is he so slow? Um, but some things have happened in our lifetime. You know, Isaiah 60, 43, I think, Isaiah 66, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, Matthew 24, like all talk about one thing specific that has to happen that happened in our lifetime, which is Israel being wiped off the face of the earth and then God drawing all of the people of Israel back into her land. That happened May 14th, 1948. In our lifetime, that has happened. So when you think, oh, Jesus, they, they've been saying this for 2,000 years, that Jesus is going to return. Absolutely, they said that. And here we are in a world now where something is very different than it was then, and that is that Israel was gone, and it's back. And that alone should get our attention. But anyway, he talks about the return of Christ and how we should live with knowing that our time is short. That's great. Well, if you missed this last week's teaching... It's online. It's on our YouTube channel. Thanks for subscribing to our YouTube. If you haven't, go ahead and click that button. Go ahead and leave a review. And and as always, on our website, if you're just catching up on what is Conduit, who is Conduit, conduitchurch.com spells out who we are, what we do, where we're at. Come join us perhaps at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. or 5 p.m. on a Sunday. Or also check out conduitmission.org and see all the different projects that we have happening across the globe. Thank you for joining us on this week's Deeper Podcast.